so to talk a little bit uh, first about our forum, so our Cultural Studies Research Forum is a nonprofit enterprise started by the students of Valat's Test to organize free public lectures, courses, and discussions in various aspects of research and cultural studies. It was inaugurated on 13th April 2021. And we invite all of you to take initiative to organize our lectures and connect us with researchers, professors, and scholars from across India to keep this program running successfully. This is our forum and each, every one of us has the opportunity here to initiate meaningful discussions and deliberations. To continue supporting us and help us build this forum. And now I would love to introduce you all to our guest speaker today, Professor Manu Mangaktu. So he is an assistant uh, professor of English, poet, editor, lyricist, film critique, research consultant, and publishing expert. He has published over nine books, 79 international research publications, 97 academic papers, and 20 edited volumes with reputed publishers like Rutledge, HarperCollins, Harvard University Press, and Penguin. He serves as chief editor for various international journals and is on the syllabus revision and approval committees of many reputed universities. So, sir, I would uh, like to invite you for the talk today. So the floor is all yours. Thank you, uh, Ankita, for the kind words of uh, welcome and introduction. Uh, dear friends, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is happy uh, after India's victory in the uh, first match of t World Cup. Uh, and today we have uh, a lecture on cultural studies. Um, I request everybody, if possible, uh, to kindly uh, turn your videos on so that I can see some faces, I can talk to people. Uh, it's always good to talk to people. Uh, so, uh, dear friends, today's lecture, uh, you know, we planned it originally as cultural studies retrospect and prospect. Uh, from the title, it is quite obvious that this lecture is looking at the past of cultural studies, the presentness of the past of cultural studies, as well as uh, making some pro prognostications into uh, the future of uh, cultural studies as well. And uh, that's why we uh, you know, uh, title this lecture, Cultural Studies, Retrospect and Prospect. Um, the organizers informed me like uh, 20 minutes ago that uh, probably we will not have a full session. Earlier I was told that uh, I could take the session until uh, 7.30 or 8. Uh, but I was told that there is some, uh, some, some other event happening after 7. So we may have to wind up uh, by 7. I don't know. Uh, I request the organizers to please confirm the uh, timings of the lecture. Anyway, uh, I, I, I understand that if it is a shortened lecture, I wouldn't be able to do full justice to the title, which is Cultural Studies Retrospect and Prospect. Still, uh, I, would, I would try my best uh, to take you through uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, some of the vital aspects in cultural studies as it existed as it exists and as it might exist, if at all. Dear friends, uh, there is a, you know, you, you might be familiar with this Chinese writer, poet, who uh, is uh, considered to be one of the founding fathers of Zen Buddhism, the Chinese version of Buddhism. His name is Zhuang Zi or Zhuang Zhu. Uh, there are two ways of uh, spelling the same name, Zhuang Zi or Zhuang Tzu. And uh, he has uh, written some extraordinary poetry, some extraordinary literature. And one such book that, that is attributed to him is titled The Butterfly as Companion. So I would uh, like to begin this lecture quoting a few lines from that particular book, a, a particular incident. He, you know, the poet describes an old man having a dream, having a dream, and what happens at the end of the dream. This is the uh, whole idea. So uh, the text reads like this: Once upon a time, I dream, I dreamed, I was a butterfly, 
fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly i was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly unaware that i was myself soon i awaked from my sleep and there i was veritably myself again now i do not know whether i was then a man dreaming i was a butterfly or whether i am now a butterfly dreaming i am a man so i would uh, like to invite your attention to the last sentence after this dream the old man says now i do not know whether i was then a man dreaming i was a butterfly or whether i am now a butterfly dreaming i am a man i hope uh, you get the essence of what the what the writer or what the old man is trying to communicate i would say that this parable or this story or this uh, verse beautifully illustrates the idea of identity formation as a process of negotiating otherness to negotiate otherness in a community we always tend to project the idea of identity formation and i believe that this identity formation that happens after this old man has this dream beautifully wonderfully mirrors and parallels this idea of identity formation i will explain it in the context of cultural studies i i'm sure that most cultural studies scholars here scholars not only in the sense that they are research scholars but experts as well uh, you know the aficionados and the experts and 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 the connoisseurs of uh, uh, you know cultural studies i'm sure they would easily identify with the situation of the old man in that parable for example uh, a person who uh, works as a historian in media studies actively involved in cultural studies research is likely to wonder at some stage of his career whether he is a media historian interested in cultural studies or a cultural studies scholar dressed up or disguised as a media historian i hope that this, this is getting clearer a person working in one field of study and interested in a field like cultural studies would likely find himself at some you know at some juncture at some uh, point in his career where he questions his own identity and asks himself whether he is if it if he is an, an art historian am i an art a, a, an art historian interested in cultural studies or am i a cultural studies scholar interested in art history why i am trying to tell you this is because cultural studies lives and breathes along the boundaries of established boundaries it lives it breathes along the boundaries of established boundaries boundaries between what boundaries between dis disciplines so we can say cultural studies has its existence somewhere in the marginal boundary spaces between various disciplines whether or not we transcend these boundaries it's up to you whether you want to transcend it whether you want to you know cross this boundary or not however cultural studies will frequently remind you that you are moving along the line of control a precarious position you are moving along the loc that you are vulnerable to theoretical bombs and gunshots from everywhere it can be from behind you it can be from the flanks or it can be from the front you will be facing theoretical bombs and gunshots at every point whenever you are walking along the margins along the walking along the boundaries of course transcending boundaries and flirting with danger has its thrills no doubt it can thrill you 
sometimes it can kill you as well for cultural studies intellectually living on the boundaries is its essence if you look at the intellectual academic you know intellectual side of it the you know the thinking side of it you know being on the boundaries is the core is the essence that make cultural studies what it is whereas if you look at in this this idea of cultural studies institutionally being on the boundaries is its vulnerable spot is its achilles heel so on the one hand uh, it's on the one hand being on boundaries is the biggest strength of cultural studies when you look at it intellectually but it is also its greatest weakness when you think about it institutionally for example when you look at institutional spaces which are occupied by cultural studies it is neither here nor there it occupies a space which doesn't properly belong to any particular discipline and this is why being on the boundaries make cultural studies susceptible to a lot of criticism susceptible to a lot of problems but also enables it to exercise its possibilities to the fullest ex fullest extent look at the title of today's lecture cultural studies retrospect and prospect now um, if you do a proper study of the history of cultural studies i'm sure that i don't have to explain to you the retrospect or the introspective retrospection part of cultural studies however what about the prospect what about what is going to happen in cultural studies how can we approach possible but unknown futures of cultural studies how how will we approach yeah we can you know uh, we can make some predictions we can uh, you know we can plan we can think how it will be but how how much of an authenticity can we claim for our predictions on the future of cultural studies how can we juxtapose the futures of cultural studies with its pastness and its presentness of and the presentness of its past this lecture ultimately would try to explore this question and bait or even in the context of a changing global world changes to understand this problem better i would like to invite you to look at two questions two very interesting questions the first question is what was happening to cultural studies at the beginning of the 21st century we all know what was happening to cultural studies before the 21st century we know the bccs and uh, stuart call and all those people but what was happening to cultural studies at the beginning of the 21st century this is the first question we will be trying to answer in this lecture secondly what was happening to literary theory at the beginning of the 21st century and ask this question because what was happening to literary theory at the beginning of the 21st century has direct connections with what what transpired in cultural studies as well now uh, we have studied about the birmingham center for contemporary cultural studies it was the institutional center of cultural studies that's what we are told this center was shut down in 2002 and absorbed into the sociology department now uh, it's a question yeah, yeah we are looking at the early parts of the early period of the 21st century so it is 2002 and the center the birmingham center bccs bccs uh, birmingham center for contemporary cultural studies it was shut down in 2002 absorbed into sociology department was that the end of cultural studies no way now uh, there is something else we need to understand about this birmingham center and its connection with cultural studies the birmingham center for contemporary cultural studies is traditionally understood as the institutional home of cultural studies or so we are told or so we are taught or so we believe 
However, it is important to realize that the corridors of the BCCC is was just one among many where cultural studies originated. No, it is not only in the discussions that happened in the cafeteria and the coffee house and the corridors of the BCCS that cultural studies originated. No way. It had other centers as well. In other words, it is historically more accurate to understand cultural studies as an international phenomenon that originated at around about the same time in different countries of the world. Okay, please remember this cultural studies, though we are told and taught, taught that it is this BCCS UK is the center, it has other roots as well. And historical study would tell you that in Scandinavia, uh, in Latin American countries, in Philippines, in, in some African countries, all these places, cultural studies was taking root without knowing that it was happening elsewhere as well. So it was not like one cultural, one version of, of course, it wasn't named cultural studies, but these things emerged simultaneously and without knowing that it was emerging elsewhere as well. So we need to remember the diverse international roots of our WOTS, of cultural studies, because such an understanding alone can help us chart the future course of cultural studies efficiently and authentically. Now, think about this. The persistent affiliation of cultural studies with the BCC is, in particular, of the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo, not Anglo-Saxon, in particular, BCC is in the Anglo-American tradition, Anglo-American perspective in general, and, and to, uh, let us say, uh, affiliation of it to an end. You know, what has happened is by connecting BCC is with the Anglo-American perspective, we are helping an intellectual hegemony. We are creating or we are allowing ourselves to be dominated by an intellectual hegemony, not an empirical historical fact. It is not a historical fact that BCCS is the only center for cultural studies. So when we say that BCCS is the center, we are in, in the stranglehold of an intellectual hegemony. Now, uh, I will explain this using examples from what is happening in the journal publishing industry, research publishing. For example, when uh, a Scandinavian scholar or an African scholar publishes in reputed international journals, especially on matters related to cultural studies, these articles are rarely read let alone cited or quoted. Whereas cultural studies theorists in the US or in, the, or in Britain routinely quote their own colleagues in their own departments or in other universities, as well as their own students on PhD thesis. Just imagine. So great scholars in other countries aren't even taken into any sort of consideration Whereas even students of the so-called scholars in cultural studies in Britain and America are being quoted and cited and read widely. So this is an intellectual hegemony that is in operation in this particular aspect. You know, uh, publishers also reinforce this hegemony. You know, what they do is they are, you know, they show, they exhibit an extreme reluctance to publish research which are not based on British or American data. I don't say they don't publish research by others because you know the research by Indians and Africans have, are required by these people to make money. So they will publish, but they are extremely reluctant. And there you can ex ex understand the reasons why our own people you know, even Asians, but Asians have a better representation thanks to our population and thanks to 
uh, the power politics that we are also good at uh, playing. But Scandinavians, Africans, they are always neglected by the publishing industry because they say your research is not based on British or American data and therefore not verifiable, not credible. So this is an intellectual hegemony that is unconsciously being created and burdened upon us on our shoulders. This hegemony has created an unproductive theoretical and empirical incongruence in the field of cultural studies. So there is, this is a problem. This is a problem. Now, then what was the implication of the DCCS being shut down in 2002 and, and being absorbed in the sociology department? What was the implication? It simply meant that by that point, by 2002, cultural studies had expanded beyond all regional, national and disciplinary boundaries. So it didn't need an institutional center to take care of it because it was everywhere. Numerous cultural studies groups, associations, departments flourished, mushroomed throughout the globe and the subject became something of a trend, a fad, a popular area of academic discipline. And if you look at the word cultural studies, you will see that more than a noun or a discipline, cultural studies represents a verb embodying a practice. It is rare that we see some theory that is, you know, uh, suffixed by something like studies. So cultural and studies. I will explain this further. So what I'm trying to tell you is more than being considered as a noun or a discipline, cultural studies is usually considered as a body of knowledge. In other words, if you speak grammatically, cultural studies mostly represents a verb, which what is a verb? Something, you know, doing, action word, something that embodies a practice. Now look at the first decade of the 21st century. The first decade of the 21st century witnessed two types of events, one in the political sphere and the other one in the academic sphere. So what happened in the political sphere? In the political sphere, in the first decade of the 20th, 21st century, we witnessed, you know, beginning with uh, the September 11 attack on the twin, uh, you know, World Trade Center towers and followed by war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq. So these things were dominating the political scene in the first decade of the 21st century. And what was happening in the academic discipline, the institutional or academic departments, which were once considered to be the hot breeding ground of high literary theory, these departments and institutional centers gradually returned to more sociological and social science oriented modes of research. This is something that happened in research, basically, but where in the academy, in the intellectual sphere, in the institutional sphere, what happened was certain departments which were waxing eloquent about high theory and high literary theory, you know, they gradually return to a more, you know, sedate, more balanced, more sociological and social science based modes of research. Twin two things that happened, one in the uh, historical sphere, I mean, political sphere, and the other one in the academic sphere. Now, these two events, one in the political sphere and the other in the academic, or you can even say, if you look at cultural studies, you can say one in the cultural aspect of cultural studies and the other in the studies aspects of cultural studies. The political, whatever happened in the political can be connected with the cultural aspect of cultural studies and whatever was happening in the institutional academic departments can be connected with the studies aspect of cultural studies. So these two events help create a, a, a kind of a sense of post 
theoretical political urgency which which made sure that those people at that at that time had very little time for the elite elitist eurocentric textual concerns of theory which people like derrida and uh, you know people like paul d men would advocate the textual concerns of theory suddenly due to these two major events one in the political sphere and, and the other in the um, institutional uh, sphere what happened was people had little time to worry little or no time to worry about the elitist um, what can i say uh, textual linguistic or the eurocentric aspects of theory theoretical approaches to the study of culture seemed more important and necessary than ever before this was the consequence what happened theoretical approaches to the study of culture suddenly loomed large people felt that they had to study or they had to focus on theoretical approaches to not literary theory but theoretical approaches to the study of culture it became more important than ever before and what also changed in the 21st century in cultural studies is that the early political sentiment of cultural studies fell by the wayside they forgot or they conveniently neglected the political dimension which was at the center of all aspirations that cultural studies had arbored harbored in its early stages so the political dimension was gradually being dropped off the actual links between cultural studies on the one hand and politics on the other hand became limited of course you can find exceptions here and there that can be pointed out there are exceptions uh, however we can safely assume that concerted sustained efforts of political intervention like what stuart hall did you know he 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 mounted a sustained intervention into the racial politics of britain in the 1980s and 1990s this was a wonderful example of how cultural studies can interfere with the political and create major changes in the way we lead our lives but what happened was from the beginning of the 21st century cultural studies conveniently forgot its political sentiment and things like what stuart hall and others were doing never took place again and during this very same time i said the bccs closed in uh, 2002 during this very same time a new generation of scholars philosophers as well as practitioners of cultural studies emerged from the shadow of the birmingham school of course it was important that the school did shut down because otherwise many people were behind its or under its shade in a in a negative sense they couldn't come out openly so what happened was a, a new set of scholars emerged who were not probably that in that interested or that influenced by the bccs it was a generation whose whole education had been shaped by theory so this this generation that uh, came up in the 2000s or 2010s they were shaped their careers their academic orientation all these things were completely shaped by the study of theory and these people frequently turned to literary theory or theory in general as a means to think through or find solutions to some of the burning issues and problems faced by the then culture and cultural studies so this new generation looked at literary theory for inspiration for solution for the problems that they faced in culture as well as in cultural studies and they looked beyond the birmingham school uh, and its theoretical framework and they looked up to the greatest minds of the early 21st century people like alain badiou 
Pierre Macri, then then Giorgio Agamben, then uh, Slavo Sisek, Mikhail Hart, Antonio Negri, the, 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 the Marxist thinkers, Antonio Negri or Etienne Balibar. So these people, this new generation looked up to these philosophers for guidance and invaluable insights into shaping the future of cultural studies. In other words, these people and their thinking constitute a, a, a trust, a new trust in a new generation of theories, theorists whose work is crucial to predicting the future of politics or the predicting the political aspirations of future cultural studies after the 21st or after the early decades, early days of the 21st century. So remember these people, people like Agamben and Macri and Hart, H-A-R-D-T, um, Michael Hart, Antonio Negri, Slavo Sisek, you know, Agamben and Alain Badiou uh, being the biggest names here. So, and a person like Ben Hoops, uh, you know, he was, an, he was like Matthew Arnold in the sense he always exhorted people to do something. So uh, he would say in the, in the early 1990s that cultural studies must be committed to a politics of difference that recognizes the importance of making space where critical dialogues can take place between intellectuals who, have, who haven't traditionally been compelled to communicate among each other. So uh, what was the idea? He said, we have to create a climate where a politics of uh, difference, we must have a commitment to a politics of difference where people belonging to interdisciplinary spaces will be brought together into proper communication. This was the aspiration of a person like Bell Hooks who had great expectations from cultural studies and who never expected that cultural studies would fall into hard times since the 21st century. And the relationship of cultural studies as theory as well as as a subject taught in our universities, this relationship of cultural studies to the culture around it has had always to be one of tension, had to be uh, a, a tense one had to be a problematic one. You cannot expect the relationship between cultural studies and the prevailing culture a smooth one. Why? Because contemporary cultures are not democratic. Yeah, we say democratic, but contemporary cultures are non-democratic. They do not satisfy the values for which, you know, which cultural studies stood for. And so, you know, we see what is happening around us. The, look at the various democracies even. Ours is a democracy. America is a de democracy. But how much of a democracy is it? The speech, the freedom of speech of many is curtailed. The practice of listening to others is terribly limited. The resources of cultural production are emphatically not shared. Not shared? Not that they are shared, the, the, the resources of cultural production are particularly reserved. We, we speak about things like copyright and this resources of cultural production are emphatically and particularly not shared among the people. And all this derives in part from the materialistic basis of contemporary culture. You know, we, we, we say often, that our culture is materialistic to the core and it has an industrialized, mechani mechanical, mechanized form. So the new territories, you know, people who are doing research in cultural studies would know that certain new territories emerged within cultural studies and, you know, the, across the <clears throat> intersection of cultural studies and cultural theory. Things like, say, for example, anti-capitalism or study of ethics in a renewed interest in the study of ethics, in the study of anti-capitalism, post-humanism, uh, post-Marxism, and even 
the transnational. So all these are some, all these became the major, uh, you know, points of uh, interest for cultural studies theorists. Alas, what has happened is evidently these days, if you look at it from the 21st century, 2020, 21, 22 period, these days evidently there is a sense of precarity. There is a sense of vulnerability about the future of cultural studies. Now, I am sure that people will not immediately agree, especially in the Indian context, because everybody is talking cultural studies. And we are having a forum of cultural studies. And this lecture is the fifth lecture. Even in 2002, they have conducted four lectures already in cultural studies, which tells us that cultural studies is very active. So, But what is happening, where it, it originated, or in those places, where cultural studies had its heydays in the 1980s and 90s, they asked questions like, is cultural studies dead? Or what was cultural studies? And such questions are extremely unsettling for the cultural studies scholars. If you look at the larger perspective, not from a typical Indian or South Asian perspective, but from a holistic uh, whole, you know, international perspective, if you look at cultural studies, this is what is happening to cultural studies. And if something is going wrong with cultural studies, then this is an important warning, a reminder of the need of cultural studies to go on theorizing. No, cultural studies shouldn't stop. It should go on theorizing in ever-changing context of political demands. So if, if this cultural studies, uh, as it did in the initial stages of the 21st century, would forget its political aspirations, then probably questions like what was cultural studies and when cultural studies died would begin to be heard even in third world countries like India very soon. And so this is the first conjecture that I was trying to make. What was happening to cultural studies in the early decades of the 21st century? Now, the second question, what was happening to literary theory at the beginning of the 21st century? Now, um, we were children probably, uh, but with, with the death of Jacques uh, Derrida in 2004, there was a feeling that the golden era, the golden generation of literary theory and theorists had come to an end. So when Derrida died, people, you know, it was, it was an implicit assumption. People all over the world felt that, okay, Derrida is gone. He began, he set off, he sparked this, uh, you know, monster called uh, cultural, you know, literary theory. So probably with the death of Derrida, the golden generation of literary theorists and theories might have come to an end. This was the assumption. And because I would explain why. Uh, if you look at the people who lived and who died before Derrida, it will become more obvious. So this was an era, you know, when you speak about the golden generation of literary theory, this era witnessed, uh, you know, theorists like the, the first person to die among the, you know, the grand... Uh, team of literary theorists was Toland Barthes. Toland Barthes died in 1980. Jacques Lacan, who provided the psychoanalytic post-structuralist versions, he died in 1981. Then uh, Paul D. Mann, the deconstructionist theorist, he died in 1983. Michel Foucault, he died of AIDS in 1984. Louis Althusser, the ideological state apparatuses, you know, uh, Althusser, very important figure. He passed away in 1990. Uh, Giles Deleuze, 1995, five years later, Deleuze. And then Emmanuel Levinas, 1995 or 96. And then uh, the apostle of postmodernism, uh, uh, you know, Jean Francois Lothard. He passed away in 1998. Pierre Baudou, he passed away in 2002. Hans-Gorge Gadamer, he passed away in 2002. And probably Derrida was the last standing, last person standing. 
and he too fell in a like uh, you know the pancha pandavas who were falling by the wayside one by one the great golden generation of literary theory fell by the wayside since the 1980s and the last to stand was probably derrida and he passed away in 2004 and people felt that these people you know because what was happening was it was it was like the shakespearean period or the elizabethan age you know 1558 to 16 not three when so many great people were living together so this was the intellectual climate that prevailed in the 1980s and 90s but in 2002 people felt that these people uh, who were at the zenith of their powers had finally bade goodbye to the world's stage i would say not world stage they bade goodbye to the world's stage now there is an implicit question that if if you want to ask you may ask what about the women then you know women have survived the onslaught of death also for example you know you can ask questions like what about the women they are all alive even today uh, think about judith butler uh, think about julia kristeva think about helen sisu think about luce irigeri catherine malibu gayatri chakravarti spivak everyone is very much alive and kicking and uh, maybe showing also s o h o v i n g showing and kicking so they are very much there but so but probably people were people are uh, male centric and patriarchal and so probably they believe that when these people passed away the golden era had come to an end and there were efforts you know uh, individual efforts here and there to champion the people who had i had mentioned earlier people like alain bodu badu uh, pierre uh, macri then uh, you know uh, sisek agamben homi ke papa uh, post marxist philosophers uh, bernard stiegler um, jean luc nancy it's a man not a lady uh jean luc nancy because i know many of you may not be aware so uh, all these person now nancy passed away in 2021 i think of suspect corona corona uh, took him so uh, these people so these people were in the since the nine, since 2004 after the death of derida these people were intermittently seen as the next big thing in literary theory however a new generation truly capable of replacing the big jacques and fouque did never emerge jacques derrida jacques lacan michel fouque you know there was never a generation who could amply and comfortably replace because the shoes that they had had to fill were very very big big shoes they had to fill and so what happened at one end of the spectrum uh, such attitudes to theory amount to the idea that the theory moment was something we had to go through at the at the time but it was just a fresh fashion or a craze theory just a fashion just a craze and derrida dead so theory is also uh, dead or let us put it uh, back on the shelf it's over Uh, now that we have done theory we are done with theory as well and now we can put it back to where it actually belongs and we may title that shelf you know you, you put those labels you can label it uh, useful approaches to culture and in that you can put all the literary theories this was one way of looking at what happened post the death of jacques derrida and people believe that we should now get on with the kind of teaching and research we should have really been doing all along yeah this derrida and others created some problems some 40 years they destroyed our teaching learning environment but now let us put all those people back in the uh, back at back in the heart let us put all those all of them in the coffin and let us continue our you know regular uh, teaching learning process this is one way of looking at what happened after derrida and towards the other end of this continuum is the view that presents theory as having once been extremely radical innovative and challenging as yes, it was innovative it was radical it was challenging but now it has been 
accepted so there is no problem it has been accepted into the mainstream of teaching academia and research and when you look at things from this perspective the theory wars were over the theory wars were the last war the last war was easily won and so much so that theory doesn't even need stand alone courses anymore in university so you don't need a course on literary theory and that is why perhaps uh, it seems less visible nowadays in our syllabi what has happened to little because people believe you know i would say that it, it to such an extent that theory, such is the extent of theories integration into the academy that many people believe that it has become almost a new canon or a new orthodoxy in academic studies so it is the obvious literary theory is the obvious so i should we speak about it when we buy a building we don't have to ask them uh, is the air free is there air or oxygen there you don't ask that right you ask about the property its price everything but you never speak about oxygen because it is a given or uh, we know what why paradamuni didn't speak about sai power in his concept of resa resa evocation because it is understood similarly people started believing that literary theory is a given it is the canon it is something that makes the canon for academic studies and so there is not much point in speaking a lot about uh, literary theory because it is very much well and truly established itself and what is the result this has resulted in something very funny and something weird as well people started creating endless series of readings producing more or less similar discoveries you know a deconstructionist reading would discover things like assemblages you know typical words aporias you reach an aporia you cannot go here you cannot go there becomings decentrings deterritorializations flows immanences presence intensities hauntings hybridities you know networks nomadic practices phallocentrism specters you know these were the words that were repeatedly used by scholars all over the world and this is one other extreme of what has happened to literary theory since 2000 you know since the beginning of the 21st century or after the death of derida and consequently most of the really interesting thing interesting stuff the cutting edge intellectual work and thought is was regarded as taking place elsewhere where in cultural studies so people started thinking that cultural studies is the place where actually something is happening literary theory has been assimilated or it has become the norm and cultural studies has become the practice and if you look at cultural studies in india it spawns a lot of questions and when you think about culture we are always very proud of our culture but in a different sense right we think of when we speak about culture we think of words like samskara or samskriti sanskriti right sanskriti the, the equivalent in 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 sanskrit or in hindi sanskriti or samskara so we think about a glorified you know over glorified mythical historical lost golden era you know uh, indian culture this is one way we understand culture usually and it is it still remains an you know it, it is troublesome for an academic to explain the idea of the cultural in cultural studies to our students because we understand culture in some other of course cultural culture has different meanings but this is one area where cultural studies scholars have faced problems in understanding and the core of cultural studies which distinguishes it from other disciplines that engage with culture is its shift from culture to the cultural it is not culture studies it is not a study of cultures but it is cultural studies so this is an important you know demarcation important point of departure between studies of culture and cultural studies the shift from culture to the cultural and we ask questions like are we doing cultural studies in india or 
Indian cultural studies. What is it? Is it Indian cultural studies or doing cultural studies in India? Is it then if we say Indian cultural studies, what decides Indian cultural studies? The boundary the, 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 that was drawn by the Britishers that defined the country called India. Is it the geographical national boundary that makes the terminology Indian cultural study possible? And if cultural studies is an anti-discipline, we usually understand cultural studies not as a discipline, but as an anti-discipline. So if it is an anti-discipline aimed at questioning the dominant ideologies, don't you think that the very plea for an Indian cultural studies is problematic? Because isn't it supporting indirectly nationalist ideologies? Look at uh, subaltern studies, for example. Subaltern theorists uh, embarked on uh, a study of the idea of nation and what nation meant. And they felt that to ameliorate, to improve the cons, you know, improve the cons, con condition of the subalterns, especially people like women, what we had to do was we had to rediscover our lost cultural values or lost national traditions. But in course of time, what happened in reality was, yes, they rediscovered the lost cultural, uh, traditional, national values of India. But along with that rediscovery, they also brought to the mainstream the various ways of subjugating women. In other words, subaltern studies, maybe consciously, maybe unconsciously, deliberately or otherwise, Subaltern studies made women a greater subaltern, more subaltern, by trying to bring the nationalist question into a discussion of, you know, subaltern studies is usually termed and combined along with cultural studies in the Indian context. So isn't there a, a problem when you speak about Indian cultural studies? Because isn't it supporting nationalist ideologies? Isn't it against the idea of mini narratives isn't it a meta narrative and then are we going back on the tenets of postmodernism you know until quite recently cultural studies enjoyed a privileged status in india and in many places people would say it still enjoys a privileged status and there existed i would say in the past tense there existed what a theorist like tejaswini niranjana would call a desire for cultural studies. And it, it's a beautiful essay by Tejaswini Niranjana. The essay itself is titled, A Desire for Cultural Studies. So she argues that in the uh, uh, early decades of the 21st century, there existed a desire for cultural studies within the Indian context. And from a time when cultural studies was seen as a marginal presence in the space of higher education in India, it has changed into being a visible and sometimes a mainstream presence, right? It wasn't, it, it existed originally in the margins, but now even in India, we see that it, it has become more and more a mainstream presence and consequently more and more in, in interna, institutions and programs are showing, started showing interest in cultural studies and Cultural studies, which was meant for the marginalized, suddenly became centralized. So how will you explain this phenomenon? These are some questions that Indian cultural studies would beg to answer or would really want us to answer. And there are three ways of understanding cultural studies. I would say three ways. Of course, there are different ways, but I would pick just three ways of understanding cultural studies. First and foremost, especially in contexts like in India, in Asia, African countries, cultural studies is seen as an umbrella for researches done both in humanities and social sciences. So even if you are, whether you are a researcher in humanities or a researcher in social sciences, they say you are doing cultural studies research. So it became an umbrella. In the, in the name cultural studies has come to mean a convenient umbrella term under which most humanities and social science research could be sheltered. And this development points to two key issues that can be picked up for our own understanding of cultural studies. One, it is a space for cultural studies is a space for interaction between disciplines. And two, 
cultural studies derives from developments not only in humanities but also in the social sciences i will give some examples and that will make it uh, clearer this form of deployment of cultural studies to mean a space where the dis different disciplines of humanities and social sciences can coexist and have a dialogue from their own homes their own private locations is used on a number of institutional sites look at, look at india what is happening you know with the in advent of integrated masters programs in several universities now the nep is promoting integrated programs and four year programs you know these things so but it existed earlier as well think about the integrated masters program in social sciences uh, taught at a place like the school of social sciences in the university of hyderabad this kind of space of disciplinary interaction seems to be opening up on a larger scale throughout india though it does not describe itself as or it from i would say in the past though it did not describe itself as cultural studies it didn't call itself cultural studies on the one hand it was called research in humanities on the other it was called research in social sciences and the two were brought together and i will give you a beautiful example of this one such example of such an initiative was the setting up of two schools in mahatma gandhi university in kottayam in kerala what happened was in the mid 1980s two schools were set up in mahatma gandhi university by uh, the great visionary writer and uh, uh the second vice chancellor of the university the one and only mr u r anandamurthy the person who said i am u r anandamurthy that anandamurthy so i am u r anandamurthy he started this idea he he muted this uh, muted this idea of having two schools simultaneously in mahatma gandhi university the first school is known as the school of letters and i'm sure there will be people here who have studied at the school of letters now what we understand by school of letters is slightly different from what school of letters actually is it was established in 1988 and uh, professor shankara pillai g shankara pillai you know uh, a great dramatist and theater act artist and activist in kerala he was the first director of the school of letters in this university so and this the school of letters is unofficially the interdisciplinary department of literature and fine arts you know school of letters is the short name for the interdisciplinary department of literature and fine arts and in its formative years it, it was uh, brilliantly guided by some of the best minds available in uh, the literary scene in kerala people like uh, professor k ayyappa panikar kadamanita ramakrishnan an unbelievable poet professor anandamurthy i am you are anandamurthy himself you know the nyanapeet awardi and the vc of the university at that time and then we had a wonderful uh, cine artist and theorist and critic a, a, a wonderful actor even uh, professor narendra prasad a, a playwright a director an actor in movies who succeeded g shankar pillai as the director of school of letters in 1989 why i mention these names is because you have to get a taste of what this school of letters was all about it was not just teachers it was not just about certain academicians controlling things it was a grand uh, idea being uh, you know taking wings at mahatma gandhi university and courses in english malayalam fine arts theater arts all these courses are being carried out in 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 the true spirit they say in the true spirit of interdisciplinary comparative cultural studies within the organized banner of this department called this place called school of letters and simultaneously you know i i would have loved to talk a lot more about it because it's a wonderful place where you can learn a lot of beautiful things but i will leave it there then simultaneously with this in 1989 another department was uh, you know inaugurated in in mahatma gandhi university and that is known as the school of social sciences sss so it was established in 1989 as an interdisciplinary department to facilitate teaching and research beyond the conventional traditional disciplinary boundaries so what is it called 
teaching beyond it is sometimes called as cultural studies as well right so what happens in this university even today you know it was never called cultural studies department but both these departments the school of social sciences and the school of letters are places are breeding grounds for good studies on good research on cultural studies so this is what has this is a beautiful example where you can see things actually taking shape in a university i can give other examples uh, as well for example but but i leave that aside the second i was telling you there are three ways of understanding cultural studies so this is the first one as an umbrella bringing together humanities and social sciences then the second way of understanding cultural studies is cultural studies is something that emerged out of english studies and here i would take the example of cefl now known as eflo it was a very prestigious place a prestigious department a prestigious institution cefl central institute of english and foreign languages it was converted it was renamed as eflo in 2006 by an act of parliament and maybe it no longer retains that same aura and glory but in 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 the early 2000s what happened was at eflo or cefl it was that time called cefl programs in cultural studies ma in cultural studies and phd in cultural studies were initiated will you believe a phd in cultural studies was awarded at cefl in 2002 and you know a phd in cultural studies was no no nobody started but somebody was even awarded a phd as early as 2000 Two. So the naming of the programs, MA in cultural studies, PhD in cultural studies, these nomenclatures clearly point to the disciplinary space occupied by these cultural studies. And the masters is structured as a cafeteria system. It's a very interesting system that they have in place, where uh, like a cafeteria, where you take token and take food. You know, you have to pay. Then you take a token and you take whatever dishes you want. You take it, you carry it to the, your table, and you sit down and you have it. This is this is the system. Now, now here a student, according to the number of credits taken during this course, goes away with a, a master's degree, either in English literature, or in cultural studies, or in linguistics, or English language teaching. so based on the credits the student can take anything you know you take a token and you can take either an ma in english literature same thing uh, or an ma in cultural studies or an ma in linguistics or an ma in elt it is you know this is a beautiful way you know i don't say it is i i cannot say now it is the same there but once it was once it was a wonderful you know cefl Uh, people even you know senior professors i hear them nostalgically reminiscing about their days at cefl and the kind of library facilities they have and things like that so um, this is what was happening at a place called a uh, place like cefl and uh, also you can look at tis you know what is it tata, tata institute of social sciences in 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 in, in mumbai so um, what is happening there or at eflo is that the cultural studies course incorporates studies like dalit studies and subaltern studies this is also interesting how dalit studies and subaltern studies are brought within the umbrella within the framework of cultural studies now what i am saying second point uh, where we can uh, three the second way of understanding cultural studies is as something that has emerged out of the english department or the english studies um, re remember for example what happened at cefl phd in cultural studies as early as 2002 or even the tis uh, i i think they had made some changes to the syllabi very recently but until recently this was the case now even look at universities like kuwempu university bangalore university university of calicut university of delhi cultural studies is taught in all these and many other universities as part of the english literary studies program so this is the second way of understanding cultural studies and thirdly or finally the third way of looking at cultural studies is as an other name for theory or i would say as a euphemism for theory cultural studies is also understood as a euphemism for literary theory what happened 
you know, I had talked about this earlier as well, what happened with the theory wars. So with the, the after the theory wars, what happened was one of the institutional responses was to take literary theory away from the elite institutional spaces of literary studies and offer it an alternative space and name, or it was called cultural studies, which addressed a broader range of texts, including mass market texts and texts in other media. Uh, people like Gerald Graff, if you want to know more about it, you can read him. And uh, what happened during the 1980s and 90s, numerous universities in the USA and UK, uh, what happened was cultural studies broke away from literary studies departments and were constituted as new or separate programs or departments. Cultural studies, not under the banner of literary studies, but a separate department called cultural studies department. And here also, uh, you can see a paradigm shift in literary studies. Uh, and rec it recommended a, a separation of you know, cultural studies from the literary literature department. And it, this was mainly with an agenda to give wings to the political aspirations of cultural studies. And this separation of cultural studies department from literature department also helped pay more attention to texts of mass and popular culture. And this trend, this third way of understanding cultural studies is mostly visible in many universities in different parts of India, where the deployment of literary theory, or I would say post-structuralist theory within the dis discipline of English or other languages, language departments, is understood simply as cultural studies itself. And uh, I'll give you two examples. One is a journal, a journal, the journal titled Journal of Contemporary Thought. If you're interested in knowing this particular version of cultural studies, where cultural studies is understood as a euphemism for literary theory, go through the website of this particular journal. It's a good journal, a nice journal, Journal of Contemporary Thought. It is based in you know, Baroda, and it attempts to do theory as a way of enabling interdisciplinary research in humanities and social sciences. So remember this journal. And, and another example I can give you is, is the, is the JNU, where we have a department or a school called the School of, um, the school of Language, Literature, and Cultural Studies, SLL and CS. So the School of Language, Literature, and Cultural Studies in JNU. This is also a wonderful example of uh, cultural studies as a euphemism for theory. Now, JNU has a very radical way of looking at it, but this also falls under the same branch, I believe. So, and, you know, JNU, you know, is one of the premier institutions. And in this particular course, scholars can pursue higher studies and research in linguistics, literatures, as well as cultural studies. So these are the three ways of understanding cultural studies. And finally, uh, organizers, can I take five more minutes or should I wind up? Okay. Uh, yes. No, sir, you can, you can. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, I, I will try to give you a, a, a synoptic view of cultural studies retrospect and prospect here. In 1961, a person like Raymond Williams complained that there was no academic subject at that time which allowed him to ask the questions he wanted to ask. What were those questions? Questions concerning how culture and society are related. Questions concerning the relationship between the individual voice and democracy. And he said, there is no discipline which where I can put forward my questions. And now looking back with the benefit of hindsight, we think we assume, we normally assume that it is cultural studies that has filled this gap for people like Raymond Williams, but that is not the case. You know, where, however, when you look, look for a consensus about what cultural studies actually involves, we find a great level of uncertainty. And I believe this is where we have to start thinking about the future or the lack of future of cultural studies. Initially, it was believed that cultural studies is a domain of knowledge, not even a discipline, but an anti-discipline or even a domain of knowledge, 
we can which can accommodate unsettling disturbing questions that other disciplines have always been afraid of asking difficult questions will be asked by cultural studies it was the earlier assumption say for example in the indian context we know how cultural studies did magnificently well in its earlier or heyday so uh, in the indian context cultural studies demonstrated its capacity to constructively inter 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 intervent in the field of the political for example uh, from the political developments following the imposition of the national emergency in 1975 by the then prime minister mrs you know indira gandhi to questions like the debate on uh, or the political mobilization that cultural studies did uh, against the mandal commission record that sought to create a quota for obc reservations or think about even uh, the kind of mobilization that cultural studies could manage within the indian context uh during the demolition of the babri masjid by hindu fundamentalists in 1991 yes cultural studies has a history where it did exhibit extreme political sensitivity but is it doing that now no probably no and then why is it not doing anything or why is it simply uh nestled or resting within the academic space alone it's the academicians alone who speak about cultural studies and if cultural studies is practiced it is just by the researchers for their phd other than that no practical work is happening in cultural studies even in a country like india where there is a lot of possibility i was recently listening uh, you know i don't want to go into controversy so i'll skip that so so in its origin in the bcc years cultural studies was considered the non discipline of the academia and it was you know some of the terms used to uh, used to define cultural studies are really interesting strange you know one word that people used to refer to cultural studies was strange or strangeness weird another phrase is unrecognized out of the system out of the academia so these were some of the words that were frequently used in the earlier days of cultural studies however the very process of inclusion of cultural studies into academia proper and cultural studies getting recognized and institutionalized has in turn caused the depoliticization of cultural studies this is what has happened and from a discipline that was threatening the established academia from the within cultural studies has these days become one among the others people don't know what is the method of cultural studies so you can use any method because it is everything anything you are doing is cultural studies if you can do anything people think that it is one among the others and cultural studies has allowed people to understand it as just one among others doing either this or that form of cultural analysis and in the many forms that cultural studies is being practiced today it has turned into a celebration of multiculturalism an unlimited celebration of diversity now this is not what cultural studies was expected to do now cultural if cultural studies is celebrating the diversity of india then has it actually is it actually doing justice to its original political commitments no it is it is not a celebration it is always something that was meant to be strange and out of the system but the moment it became institutionalized what has happened is cultural studies has lost its violent passionate face fse face fse or phsc face it lost its violent face it has become not only a discipline but also disciplined tamed cultural studies has been tamed by being take, by taking it to the uh, rigors of the academy it has become disciplined and it has become a discipline as well and it's now what cultural studies is doing is it supports the status quo let us just maintain the status quo everything is fine the new normal okay now everything is fine let us not go not worry about other things because that will cause 
problems. In other terms, cultural studies has lost its violent and passionate encounter with society and has become a, what can I say, a, a, a tamed, politically correct, nice to do with non-encountering venture. No, we don't want any controversies. We are very good people. We will remain politically correct. We, you know, we are good people. Nice. Cultural studies is nice. And in this regard, cultural studies today has betrayed its core values. And I would say that this betrayal by cultural studies of its own values explains the present precarity and vulnerability that cultural studies has fallen into. So with that, I wind up this lecture. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope I made some sense. Of course, uh, if there is time and if the organizers permit, we can definitely have an interactive session. Thank you so much. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, if you like to do it. Yes, Can yes, I, I like this. Point? Yes, I like this. Okay. With, with, with what time? Uh, what time? Uh, what time? Uh, it is from Kushbu. And the uh, thing is, is cultural studies today connected all over the world, particularly two aspects, culture and studies, theoretical and practical or political aspects? No, I would say that cultural studies is practiced haphazardly. Different universities, different colleges, different institutional centers have different ways of doing cultural studies. You know, the, one simple way of understanding that is by looking at the syllabi of cultural studies in our own universities. Go through the uh, syllabi of various universities in India where they teach cultural studies as a paper. There you find a lot of uh, interesting differences. It is never about similarities. It is always a case of differences. For example, uh, there is a cultural studies department in Tezpur University in Assam. I, no, Tezpur University, it's, if I remember correctly. So that particular university, and this has come for a lot of uh, critical uh, thought as well. If that university, cultural studies is more or less equated with folklore studies. In some universities in Rajasthan and Gujarat, cultural studies is equated with a study of the native culture. In some universities in India, cultural studies is understood as a study of Indian nationalism and Indian identity. In some uh, universities, cultural studies is understood as a revisiting or a, or, or a recapitulation of whatever happened in the British and American institutional systems in the early days of cultural study. So they study people like Stuart Hall and others. So this is another way in which cultural studies is understood or is being practiced. So I would, yeah, there are certain umbrellas within which cultural studies are being brought together, but more often than not, cultural studies is a splintering discipline. It's a discipline that fragments and goes into different areas without a unifying principle. And I believe it is good also. It is not that I'm not, I'm not saying that all the universities should have a, you know, a unified system of understanding cultural studies, nothing like that. But, uh, you know, when you, when you ask what cultural studies is to a scholar from Assam, he would say cultural studies is folklore folklore, the study of folk traditions. If you ask what cultural studies is uh, to a person down south in Kerala, uh, he will say cultural studies is about what happened in the 1960s and 70s in the Birmingham Center for Cultural Contemporary Cultural Studies. If you ask someone uh, from Mumbai, Tis, he would say or she would say that cultural studies is about the various practices followed by the social sciences. So there is no one way of understanding cultural studies and hence the connection between cultural studies all over the world is a difficult and impos you know, mostly impossible to achieve proposition. That said, uh, I would say that there are certain common elements as well in cultural studies. Obviously, 
it it has a cultural dimension to it which is which can be extrapolated to mean the political or the social dimension and it has a studies dimension to it which can be understood as the pedagogical or the institutional dimension of cultural study so uh, this is what i would say and yeah in some places even today cultural studies has some political aspirations and it is trying uh, for example in bangalore i know uh, you know some people from bangalore university uh, they are trying to create a new center for cultural studies in bangalore and they are trying to have uh, a more unified and you know they use the word cell culture they don't call school of cultural studies the plan is they want a cell for cultural studies now the word cell is very interesting by cell it could mean that the prison is a cell uh, you know where you don't have voice where you are in prison where your freedom is curtailed all those things the cell can also be understood as the battery which which is the source of energy for action the cell can also be understood as the smallest unit of life so there are different ways of understanding uh, the cell and i don't know whether they envisage it like that but i would like to look at uh, this development in bangalore as something very interesting and positive i don't know whether it will materialize but they are planning uh, things like that so there are things happening and i would say that this this particular venture uh, what is this this forum for uh, you know forum for cultural studies right so these these are separate enterprises which are trying to bring cultural studies to the mainstream of our thought but interestingly or ironically by bringing cultural studies to the mainstream of our thought we are removing cultural studies from its original political aspirations so this is the interesting part yes that is my um, end so thank you so much sir good evening everyone i am koyal banerji and uh, it has such been a honor to be a part of this wonderful event on behalf of uh, cultural studies research forum i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest dr manu mangat genuinely a lot of thanks to you sir for enlightening us with your profound knowledge on this ample field that open up various ideas for students like us it's such an uh, such a pleasure to listen to you throughout the session uh, we would look forward to gather more from you in the upcoming discourses now i would like to thank sincerely to the patron of valat taste dr kalani valat who is our inspiration and to my team comprising prijit ankita and roy and also to our whole team this a wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants who made the event a memorable one finally i would like to thank all of you present here for making the time to be with us today and helping us make make this event a grand success thank you one and all uh, now sir uh, is the time to wrap up today's session i hope it's okay yes uh, thank you koil uh, for uh, wonderfully wrapping us up the session um, i know that i haven't been able to take up all the questions so if you have questions feel free to contact me i have put my uh, whatsapp number and email address in the chat box my number is 9496322 uh what okay sir i think yeah. someone yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah that is it so thank you for the opportunity so we will we will have we will have one more section and we will uh, inform you hey. know the audience the participants very soon as we discussed before one best lady yes coil yes yes okay then have a wonderful evening all of you take care keep learning and uh, always remember the motto of our test the best is yet to be thank you so much